Good morning. Good morning. It is a good morning, and it is a great blessing that we get to gather here on a rainy Sunday morning to worship the living God. So I welcome you. Uh, before we begin our worship, I have a couple of announcements to share. First of all, uh, some of you may not even know it, but we have Christmas cards in, in a little mailbox to the left as you, as you leave the sanctuary. And check it out, because there may be a card for you. Apparently, it's just full of cards right now. So that's no, announcement number two. Number one, announcement number two, um, we do have coffee hour today. And as you go to coffee hour, would you please check and see if you have any dishes that are left over in the kitchen? Because apparently, there's a bunch of them. And there is a threat involved here that if you don't get your dishes, they're going to be sold. <laughs> so get your dishes. Um, and finally, the third announcement is to, is to pay attention to this insert about our 2020 vision gatherings at, at uh, Gender Road. And we hope that everyone will participate in at least one of those. So check it out, check it with your calendar. So I am Reverend Margot Connor. Uh, uh, Pastor John is, uh, is not here right now. We hope that he is resting and sunbathing or doing something wonderful in Florida as he is um, taking time off with his family. But we are here, and God is here. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Loving and faithful God, we just thank you for worship, for this gift of worship. And I pray for each one who is gathered here in this holy sanctuary and online, that we might open ourselves, our minds, our souls, our hearts, to your life-giving presence. May we encounter you during this time of worship. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We turn now to the Christmas reading. If you were here on Christmas Eve, you heard all of this and we'll and we will hear it again this morning. Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in, in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they had made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. 
Um, this is, we have, during the season of Advent, had this season, this symbol for us, a symbol as we prepared ourselves for our celebration of Christmas. And it was these four blue candles. And so we light them once again in this season, which is called Christmas Tide. First, we light the candle of hope. And the second candle represents peace, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. The third candle represents joy, the joy that we have of his coming, the joy that we have of his being with us. And finally, the fourth candle is the candle of love. Love came down at Christmas. And finally, we do light the Christ candle, which represents for us Emmanuel, God is with us. God incarnate is with us in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to read the whole scripture again. Instead, I'm going to read verse 19 and 20. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is always an interesting Sunday to preach. We have had um, four weeks to prepare during Advent. Then we had Christmas, Christmas Eve services, and the word the, was incarnation at Christmas. And now today, this is called Christmas Tide. We're no longer in Advent. This is called Christmas Tide. And, but we are, as you know, in between, aren't we? We're in between Christmas and we're in between New Year's. Culturally, this is a time of looking back um, looking, I like looking back and looking at lists of the best movies of the year, the best books of the year, the best uh, historical events of the year, pictures of the year. And in this case, as we're going into 2020, I'm, it's the best of the decade because we're changing decades now too. And looking forward, you know, we're looking at our visioning here at, at Gender Road. Um, and, of course, there's the ever-popular New Year's resolutions that we either make or don't make and keep or don't keep. Um, and there's always, in all of our lives, there's that forward movement. You know, we're moving forward, right? I, I'm wondering how many of you have taken down your Christmas tree by now. Anybody? Some people have. Okay. I went to listen to Christmas music on Sunny 95 the day after Christmas, and it's gone, okay? We're moving forward. So this morning, I want to spend a little time with this text and watch Mary, see what she has to show us. And there is an important word that I'm lifting up. I think you know what it is. It is ponder. It is pondering. Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. And my suggestion is, as we're looking ahead to New Year's resolutions, maybe intentions, that we might have an intention for 2020 of spiritual growth. This is one of the most wonderful parts about getting older. There's so much that's not good about getting older, right? Can I have a witness? <laughs> However, what's really remarkable is, no matter how old you are, there's still room for growth. So we're, God is never, ever done with us. So, um, and the intention, this whole idea of intention is perhaps to ask yourself some questions every day. The questions that I see that come out of this text. And the first text, the first question is that I wonder if Mary asked herself as she was pondering is, what just happened here? What happened here? What is happening here? Because when you go back to Mary, 
Just imagine what happened to her in the course of a year. You know, a year before, she was a young woman who, the Bible tells us, was betrothed to Joseph, and I would think expecting to live what would be a conventional life. Then, a visitation from an angel who tells her she's the favored one. And she ponders that, the Bible tells us, and tells her that she's going to conceive and give birth to a son. Mary does respond, yes, I am the Lord's servant. Some month, months later, when she looks back, well, she had this visit to her cousin Elizabeth, who, like herself, had a, a, a pregnancy that was kind of impossible, but happening. And then at the same time, Joseph, who has every right to reject her, stays with her, does not shame her, and actually names the baby not after himself, as is the custom, but Jesus, because there was an angel that requested that in a dream. An angel that requested that in a dream. And then the trip to Bethlehem, supposedly at the order of the emperor, but the reality meant that that baby was going to be born in Bethlehem in line with prophecy. Then, of course, we know the story, no room at the end, but then this miraculous opening of a stable, and then a visit from these strange shepherds who shared what the angel told them. She's treasuring it, but I think she's saying, what is happening here? A series of incredible, amazing, and miraculous events driven by dreams and angels with a little bit of help from Quirinius. What just happened? I wonder, do you ever do that? Do you ever sit back and look at your life and the events of your life and say, what just happened here? I do. I do it after, certainly after a death. I remember doing it after births. I remember doing it, actually I remember doing it in October of this year. After Pastor John asked me to, to come and help out here, I thought, what just happened here? Meaning, what's God doing here? What am I doing here? Uh, when ours may not be driven by angels and, and dreams necessarily, um, but it is, for me, it's coincidences, it's serendipity, it's love, it's beauty. All of a sudden, you, what's happening? Frederick Buechner has written at length about the importance of what he calls listening to our own lives. He writes, listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery that it is. In the boredom and pain of it, no less than in the excitement and gladness. Touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments and life itself is grace. Now what I see is many of us, myself included, moving from thing to thing, event to event, distraction to distraction. Finishing this Christmas season, there's some of you have been really busy, and if you haven't been, your children have been. My children are, um, are victims of divorced parents, and they have four or five Christmases go from place to place to place to place. And we see everybody these days with the ubiquitous cell phones so that while we may actually have downtime, we don't really clear the decks for pondering and wondering. Thich Nhat Hanh said, whenever we have 15 free minutes, an hour or two, we have the habit of using our computers or cell phones, music or conversations to forget and to run away from the reality of the elements that make up our beings. Can we sit back after something has happened and savor and ponder and wonder what has God been doing in all of this? I remember, and it's been probably 30 years, sitting with a bunch of clergy in a meeting as they are all grousing, and I would say humble bragging, about how very busy they are, right? 
And um, they just don't have time. They just don't have time. And our regional minister at the time, Howard Radcliffe, looked at one of them and asked what I would call a piercing question, which was, who makes up your schedule? Okay. Now, obviously, to be clergy, now I think you all know that clergy do not work one day a week, but one day a week you know we will be here. <laughs> that one's written in ink. But the rest of it, who makes up your schedule? And for the rest of us, now maybe we don't have a lot of freedom between 8 to 5, maybe you don't, but maybe you do. And certainly have a lot of freedom before you go to work and after you go to work. Who makes up your schedule? So that as we look ahead to 2020, ask yourself, am I going to this year make time for pondering God's activity in my life? Am I going to take the time to ask the question on a regular basis, what is happening here? What is God doing and what am I doing? And the second part of this pondering that I think Mary did is about the baby Jesus. I think she looked at that baby and said, who is this baby? Who is Jesus? I have three daughters, and uh, if you were here at the Christmas Eve service, you might have seen two of them, because I was very proud of them, having them here. And when they were growing up, and still, I have to say still to this day, um, but especially when they were younger and they were doing things publicly, like let's say in the band or in the choir, and I'd be sitting in the stands and I'd be looking at them doing whatever they were doing, I would look at them and I would think to myself, who are you? Because I knew I really didn't know everything about who they were. We like to tell ourselves we do, but we don't. And of course, you'd go to teachers' conferences and you'd find out this girl who's a chatterbox at home is quiet as a mouse at school, or, or this one's not handing in her homework for some reason, or this one's really good at science, of all things. I mean, my point is, we think we know people, but we don't. There's always surprises. And so to Mary, this young girl, just imagine what she wanted for her baby. She wanted him to grow up to be healthy, to have a good life. Maybe she wanted him to follow in his father's footsteps. Joseph, that is. Maybe she wanted him to be a comfort to her in her old age. And of course, we sit here and we know the rest of the story. We know that it started, according to the Bible, when he was 12 years old and he's in the temple, and he's no longer doing what Mary and Joseph want him to do, but he's following God in some sort of way and pulling away from her. And throughout the years to come, you wonder if she was continually asking this question, who is he? Who is Jesus? And for us, my suggestion is that needs to be our question. That needs to be the question of our lives. That is, if we identify ourselves as Christians, I think we need to spend our lives looking at Jesus and saying, who are you? Who are you? Who are you to me? What is it that you're trying to show me? Where is it that you're trying to lead me? Now this season, we're, looking at, we're spending a lot of time looking at this baby. It's important. The baby is born into this world so vulnerable. And, and clearly God is in control and God is protecting this baby. And we see, you know, this unwed mother who's there with these first visitors, the workers in the field. So there's this wonder and glory about this baby. So that's, that's part of who Jesus is. But as the year is going to go on, you're going to hear lots more stories about Jesus. And we're going to encounter not Jesus the baby, but Jesus the man. And I wonder whether we limit our understanding of who Jesus is. I just wonder about that. And kind of flatten them out. Um, 
One of my many guilty pleasures, one of my guilty pleasures is award shows. I like to watch award shows. And coming up soon is the Golden Globes and the Oscars. Um, I don't know if anybody else likes this stuff. Um, but it's the award show with the country music performers that, that often you hear people thanking God and thanking Jesus more than in the, at the movies, okay? Have you ever watched those? And I remember watching, and I think it was Reba uh, who was winning something, and she talked about, you know, she did that, and she said, and I want to thank my buddy. I want to thank my buddy, Jesus, um, which is fine. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus is our friend. But remember, Jesus is more than that. Jesus is more than a baby. Jesus is more than a buddy. In fact, it's interesting. I, I hadn't even, a true confession, I hadn't even read the liturgy that we just read, but it said God of a thousand faces. We have a Jesus of a thousand faces that, that is more than a baby, more than just our buddy. He's the one who heals and teaches and exercises in the word that is used in the Bible with authority, with authority. And he willingly goes to Jerusalem and he suffers, he's rejected, he dies on a cross and, and he comes back. And like Mary, maybe we too need to ponder who this Jesus is, all of him, asking the question, who are you? What are you trying to show me? Where is it that you're trying to lead me this year? There is a quote that I've always found to be um, somewhat disquieting and challenging. It is by G.K. Chesterton. I don't know whether you've ever heard it. It says, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. I'll read it again. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. So I guess what I'm saying as we look at this new year that's coming, I'm saying, well, let's try it this year. Let's take seriously the person of Jesus Christ, not just as an ancient story from 2,000 years ago, but as a living reality in our lives. Who wants to love us and help us to know how loved we are and also wants to have his way with us and help us to become more like him? Now, not perfect, not perfect, but full of compassion and mercy and courage and grace. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, God does not give us everything we want, but he does fulfill his promises, leading us along the best and straightest paths to himself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It says that in the Bible. But the question for us is, are we going to invite him to be our way, our truth, and our life? So, in summary, I'm just going to uh, leave you with the questions to ponder and the invitation to begin 2020, 2020, with an intention of spiritual growth. Could this be the year of becoming more contemplative and developing what we might call a pondering practice? asking yourself questions on a regular basis, questions that might anchor your faith and guide you as you intentionally deepen your relationship with the living God. Asking questions of your life, what is happening here? What is God doing with me? What am I doing? I think those questions lead us to awareness and gratitude and awe. And asking questions of Jesus. Who are you? Who are you? What are you showing me? And where are you leading me now? These are the questions that lead to a changed life and new beginnings. The life of the follower of Jesus is not always easy, 
but it is always worth it. I'm going to end with one more quote I found, and this is by D.L. Moody. No one can sum up all God is able to accomplish through one solitary life, wholly yielded, adjusted, and obedient to him. May that be your life in 2020. Amen.